Hello, it's Larissa Ko. We are going to talk about finding, using, and citing text evidence. One thing you need to understand is that people don't always just take your word for things. Just because you say something or write something doesn't mean that it's persuasive or true for that matter. So finding text evidence is adding evidence to persuade your audience about what you're saying or writing. When you can point to the answers and give evidence and you practice that skill, it's going to be really useful throughout your life so that you can be a more persuasive person. So using text evidence is simply using quotes or examples from what you've read to support what you are saying. When I say quotes, I don't mean in your book you find things that are already in quotation marks. I mean you copy and paste a short portion of the text, put it in your answer, and add quotation marks. That's what makes it into a quote. And even if you're putting something in your own words, if the idea or thought or statistic comes from another text, you still consider that text evidence and you cite it like you would a quote. There are two different uses for text evidence that we'll look at. The first one is text evidence for comprehension questions. So comprehension questions are ones that are just checking to see that you understood what you just read. And it's easy to find text evidence to support questions about what a text explicitly says. So you just look through it and search until you find the part in the story that gives the answer to the question. That is your text evidence. Okay, I'm going to do an example with you of finding text evidence for a comprehension question. So our question is, how does Eurydice die? Now I'm going to go into the text and skim through it until I find that part. After I read it, I probably kind of remember it was in, I know it was in the first paragraph, so let me skim through here. Oh, I see, and she died. So the question is, how did she die? So let's go a little bit before that. Um, the result of that sad wedding proved more terrible than such foreboding fates, while through the grass delighted naiads wandered with the bride, a serpent struck its venom tooth in her soft ankle, and she died. Okay, I only want to pull out the part of this text that answers my question. So I don't need to talk about naiads wandering with the bride, I just need this. A serpent struck its venomed tooth in her soft ankle, and she died. So I am going to copy this. I just added the quote from the story into my answer right here. So a serpent struck its venomed tooth into her soft ankle and she died. Okay, when I'm answering a question though, I don't ever just answer with a quote. I need to add my own words. Usually you put your own words before you put the evidence. First you say your point, then you support it. So Eurydice died from a snake bite. Okay, so now I have my answer in my own words, I have my evidence, but I'm not done yet. So I need this sentence to flow like a sentence. So Eurydice died from a snake bite. A serpent struck its venom tooth into her soft ankle and she died. As is, this is what we call a run-on sentence. So just because I'm pulling a quote doesn't mean that it doesn't have to follow grammar rules anymore. I need to change this around a little bit so that it still is grammatically correct. So Eurydice died from a snake bite. I could just add a semicolon and then we're good. Semicolons separate an independent clause from an independent clause. So I could leave it like that and I'm done. No, I'm not done. I still need a citation. Anytime I have a quote or I'm referencing something from another text, I need to give credit to the author. So the author, so if you don't remember the author's name, just go back to the text, scroll up, and it's usually going to be right there. So Ovid is this guy's name. Ovid. Okay, now you would put the page number or in a case like this that doesn't have page numbers, it just has paragraphs, which are denoted right here, paragraph 1, 2, etc., down to 5. I just put the paragraph number in instead. So it says 1, I could do Ovid, comma, paragraph 1. And now you see that I still don't have a period for my sentence. Of course I need a period for my sentence, but it's not going to go here like you might expect. It's going to go at the very end of the entire thing. You want to keep your whole thing together, your words, 
the quote, the citation all together in one sentence with a period at the very end. So here again is my question. How did Eurydice die? Here's my answer. Eurydice died from a snake bite. A serpent struck its venomed tooth into her soft ankle and she died. So that is an example of using text evidence for a comprehension question. Now we're going on to the harder type of question. Analysis questions ask you to think deeper. They don't just want to show that you understood explicitly what you read. They want you to think and put things together and make some guesses or inferences to answer a deeper question. So it is harder to find text evidence for inferences that you make about the text because you can't just copy and paste the exact answer from the text. The answer isn't there. You have to read between the lines to come up with your conclusions, and then to support your conclusions, you still need text evidence. So what you do is you include the clues that led you to your conclusions. Then you explain your reasoning. So for the picture of this one, I put up one of those detective messy boards where they draw conclusions and make connections. That's what you're doing to draw an inference, and you need to explain how you got to your inference to the jury. Well, in this case, you explain to your reader how you came to the conclusion based on the clues that you provide. So let's do this one together now. The question is, in the context of this text, referring again to Orpheus and Eurydice, what can we learn from tragedy? Okay, you can already see that's a more open and interesting question. And there is no part of the text that says, you can learn from this text about tragedy that blah, 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 blah. So I have to come to a conclusion or make an inference to figure that out. So uh, let's think about this. The big tragedy that happens in this story is that this happily married Orpheus suddenly and unexpectedly loses his new wife when she dies. Then he goes and tries to fix the problem. He goes to Pluto or Hades, the god of the underworld. He begs for his wife back and he even says that she can. And he even says that she can come back to life for a while if he follows the rules. But he doesn't quite follow the rules. He turned his eyes to gaze upon her when he wasn't supposed to look at her. And instantly, she slipped away. He stretched out to her his despairing arms, eager, eager to rescue her or free her form, but could hold nothing save the yielding air. I think this is a powerful part about tragedy. If I'm trying to figure out what this author is saying about tragedy, I can look at this and say he's definitely not being super hopeful about it. He's not saying that it's something that we can easily overcome. And even if we try to fix the tragedy, it can be to no avail. So that's one thing that I could talk about. So I'm going to copy this and see how I can put it into an answer once I've thought about this some more. Okay, I pasted my quote into here. I'm adding some quotation marks, deleting this last period because remember the period goes at the end. And I'm going to think some more about my question and the answer. So instantly she slipped away. He stretched out to her his despairing arms, eager to rescue her or feel her form, but could hold nothing save the yielding air. So this is the part about how he could not save her. He couldn't escape tragedy. So I want to find a quote that talks about how hard Orpheus tries to escape tragedy. So this is the part where Orpheus is going through the underworld, determined to get her back. Here he's trying to persuade the god of the underworld to let her go. I'm saying that we'll both be back to you soon enough anyways. Just give me a little more time with her. So I'm finding that this part about him going and getting past Cerberus, singing the song, reasoning with Pluto, all of this is 
quite lengthy, and there's not really a good little quote that I can pull out. So instead, I'm going to add evidence from the text, but not a quote. So I'm going to explain part of the story. Orpheus went to great lengths to get his wife back. He went to the underworld, faced the three-headed dog, and reasoned with Hades. Okay, so this part where I'm listing parts of the plot, that's going to be my next bit of text evidence, or evidence from the text. So I'm going to still put Ovid, because I'm citing this evidence even though it's not a direct quote, and I'm going to put the paragraph numbers for this as well. So paragraphs 2 and 3, that's where these plot points happen. So in my citation, I'm going to put Ovid, paragraphs 2 through 3, and again, the period goes at the very end. It doesn't go before the parentheses. Okay, so Orpheus went to great lengths to get his wife back. He went to the underworld, faced a three-headed dog, and reasoned with the god of the underworld in an attempt to bring her back. However, even his impressive attempts... Okay, so my first clue is this listing of events. Orpheus went to great lengths to get his wife back. He went to the underworld, faced a three-headed dog, and reasoned with the god of the underworld in an attempt to bring her back to life. My second clue is instantly she slipped away. He stretched out to her his despairing arms, eager to rescue her or feel her form, but could hold nothing save the yielding air. Now I need to connect the dots for the reader. I need the reader to understand how these two bits of evidence lead to my conclusion that, and I'll put this up here, despite our best attempts, nobody can escape tragedy. So that's kind of what we learn about tragedy. And maybe from going through the, that tragedy, we learn that we are not invincible. Now I'm going to connect to my first piece of evidence. So Orpheus learned the hard way in the story. He went to great lengths to get his wife back. He went to the underworld, faced a three-headed dog, and reasoned with the god of the underworld in an attempt to bring her back to life. Okay, now I need to connect that to this next one. However, this talented, determined brave hero of the story could not save her in the end. When they were almost back, when they were almost back, he broke his end of the deal with, he had made with Pluto, and instantly she slipped away. He stretched out to her his despairing arms, eager to rescue her or feel her form, but could hold nothing save the yielding air. Okay, so I changed this so that it reads grammatically correct, but now you see that we have a capital I in the middle of a sentence. We need to make it lowercase. The way you do it is you use these square brackets to change it from an uppercase I to a lowercase I. So now this sentence all goes together, and it fits, and it connects, and it answers the question. One last thing, though. We never leave quotes at the end of a body paragraph. So after we put this, we kind of add a concluding sentence. So that's a nice little wrap up, and then I'm ending with my own words instead of ending with a quote, which you never want to do. Okay, so that's my example for an analysis question. I answered the question with my own ideas based on the text, but I added clues, and I explained how I got to the conclusion from the clues. So a word about citations. So formal MLA citations look like this. Let's put one together. I use a citation I use citationmachine.net. I'm going to copy the source that I got it from. Create citations. Now I click website. Paste it. It pulls up the site that I got it from. And it gets a bunch of the information for us, but not all of the information. So we need to go to continue 
And a very important thing that's missing is the author's name. So we just call him Ovid. We don't know about a last name. We don't know about a last name for this guy. He's very old. So article title, Orpheus and Eurydice, that's right. Author, Ovid, that's right. URL, that's right. Publish date. We'll see if we have one of those. And no. Date accessed, that's right. Complete citation. And this will put it into APA6 format. So we need to switch this to MLA. You always want to do the newest version, so MLA8. And here is my citation. So these citations go on your works cited page. And that's going to be the last page of an essay or the reference page of a slideshow. It goes at the very end and it looks like this. You put them in alphabetical order once you have all of the sources that you use in your paper. Uh, you can use a link as an informal citation. So say this is a smaller type of essay assignment thing and your teacher specifies that informal citations are okay. You just copy the URL, paste the URL, and then you hit control K. That turns it to an actual link. So now when I go to this, it'll pull up the source. You have citations at the end, but you also have in-text citations throughout. We talked about those earlier. At a minimum, you need to include the author's last name. If there's no author's last name given, you use a shortened version of the title. So that's all that I have for you. Remember, when you're using citations to include your own words, add quotes or paraphrase things from the text, always put in-text citations and then put formal MLA citations at the end. Hopefully this is useful information and will come in handy multiple times. Until the next lesson, see you later.